This is a Socialist News and Views special interview. I'm Nick Schillingford coming to you from the Urban Cabin Studios in South Minneapolis with this special interview. Thanks so much. Let's do it. Let's get into it, man. Yeah, let's jump right into it. Yeah, so I really appreciate you joining me. I've been, you know, watching you from afar, you know, the things that you've been doing for a while and been excited about, a, you know, a chance to talk with you. So on Socialist News and Views, we let folks introduce themselves. Can you just let our audience know who you are? Yeah, my name is Stephen Jolly. I'm a construction worker, CFMEU, is the construction union in Australia member for maybe 25 years. Um, I've also been a councillor at the city of Yarra, which is sort of the inner northern suburbs of Melbourne, one of the most influential sort of politically speaking parts of Australia since 2004. And then about three weeks ago, I led a coalition that took over the council and I got elected mayor about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. It's been a bit hectic, um, but yeah. historically, I, like I was brought up, I was born in London, brought up in Ireland and South Africa and was involved with the militant tenancy and worked for them in different parts of the world for many, many years. Um, and uh, that's like in a nutshell, I guess, you know, just to start us off. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you mentioned that you've been on the council in Yara for 20 years, uh, since it's 2004. Um, and then you said, I, I think it was what, November 19th of this year, you were elected mayor. Um, I just yeah. want, I just want to hear what, you know, about that process. What was that like? Um, you know, what are the biggest differences you're going to see between just being a member of the council and now being the mayor? And then, you know, you're already starting to put things into place, you know, like what, what has been going on just in the past like week since you were elected? I'd love to hear. Well, I mean, it's a big difference from throwing rocks at the joint for 20 years to actually being in the hot seat like I am mm-hmm. now. It's a lot of responsibility. And, you know, especially speaking, somebody who's come out of the socialist movement or and right. considers myself Marxist to this day, um, seeing workers, leaders in the union movement, in community organizations, and obviously in the political arena, get elected and just sell out almost immediately. Right. Um, so we took the position... Um, that right from the start, we would outline our program. And we said to the punters, to the public, in the first 100 days, we would try to implement the program. We actually did it in 12 days. So in between the election results were announced and the very, very first council meeting, in between that time I was elected mayor, that was like an in-house meeting, a ceremonial meeting. And then last Tuesday, we had the first proper council meeting. And we had what we described as an omnibus bill, like a composite motion. Um, of 23 parts, some of it really, really minor stuff like dog poo and, you know, moving the bike lane from here to there. But some of it actually quite exciting stuff. Um, For example, uh, building housing for working class young people on land that the council owned, which if we do it, if we pull it off, would be the first time that any council in Australia, in the history of Australia has ever done that. So that's something that we could start in the hour and then hopefully use that as a leverage to spread to other progressive councils and then nationally. So we we copped a lot of flack from our political opponents for going too fast. We make zero fuck apologies about that. I mean, we 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 took advantage of the politically speaking, we took advantage of the momentum. The locals just are shocked that we actually did what we were going to do, and the response has been overwhelming. That the council meeting on Tuesday night was absolutely jam packed. All the mass media covered it. It was live, um, and um, yeah, like we're we're riding a we're riding a big wave here. Um, the state government in this part of Australia, Victoria, the second largest state, is Labour. They now think that they can sort of recover in the inner city because historically the Greens have been quite quite powerful. We just smashed them in the council election. So they are now coming to the party and saying they want to work with this council um, for their own fucked up reasons. You right. Know? But, um, but they're richer and bigger and, and more powerful than we are. So um, it's almost like when you're 18 in a share house and, one of you, one, and a guy rocks up to your door, you don't really like him. But he's got a big bag of dope and he's got six, you know, slabs of alcohol. You gotta let him into your party. You know what I mean? Right, he's right, right, right. For the next three, three hours. So the state the state government at the moment for their own reasons are uh, wanting to work with us. So we're I'm trying to take advantage of that to build sports stadiums and do this housing projects that I've been talking to you about. Um and um it's nice to be a mayor with massive community support 
and a state government for their own reasons who are opening up the checkbook. Um, and But at the end of the day, Nick, you know, we're going to get judged at the end of the day by what okay. we do and not by what we say. But so far, so good. You know, I mean, having said that, we're only four days into the term, but, you know, since right. the meeting. Well, what is, uh, you know, you said there's been overwhelming community support and people have been really excited. What kinds of things have they said to you uh, about uh, about what? Um, they, they, people's expectations are really low. Right. Um, people are super cynical. And that's something that is healthy. That's a really, really good instinct. Like they look at, the, you know, the Labour and the Liberal, which are the, the traditionally centre-right, centre-left parties in Australia. They look at the Greens that control the inner city of Melbourne. Um, and they just see two big parties and one large, small party um, mm. that have just consistently not followed through with their promises. Um, and to, to so, so they're really excited about the fact that we've just driven this ahead. And our opposition, instead of just going with the flow, they're actually not that smart. They actually started raising all these bureaucratic um, obstacles, and not even obstacles, but criticisms oh, you know, there should have been a consultation period. You're just rushing this through to... And I said, mate, you've got collective amnesia. The, the consultation was the election. You do a consultation at best, or an opinion poll, at best you're talking to 5% of the population. Maybe half a percent is more likely. We had a, we, we've got compulsory voting in Australia. So the election, even at a local council level, over 70% of people voted for the program that I'm leading and the group that I'm that I'm leading and, and, and part of. Um, so we don't need more consultation. We need to do, and, and, and that's, what, that's what we're doing, you know? Yeah, and you, that's fantastic. And it was really exciting to see, obviously. And, you know, again, uh, it's not just in Australia. You know, in the U.S., uh, the politicians continually fail to follow through with the things that they say they're going to do, too, uh, you know, on a massive scale. Um, you know, we've had some successes here in Minneapolis where I live. But, uh, but yeah, for the for the most part, and that's because they're socialists there. But, but for the most part, uh, you know, they fail to uh, follow through. But do they really fail or, you know, that's really part of the uh, the plan to uh, rule in favor of the uh, of those in power? Um, you know, you mentioned the Greens. There's, so there's Greens on uh, City Council in Yara. Um, and I know there's been plenty of disagreements with the Greens, obviously. Um, I believe even I saw something you posted about one member of Parliament, uh, Green, comparing you to Donald Trump or something like that. Was that a th was that? Yeah, something? yeah, she did that. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the Greens are, uh, you know, a, a large, small party. They're like a third party in Australia. Mm. Uh, and they're powerful amongst the professional managerial class. Um, they are on social issues to the slightly to the left of the Labour Party, the, the main sort of like the similar to the Labour Party in the, in the, in the UK or New Zealand, um, and on issues like refugees, on, you know, climate change, obviously they're slightly to the left of the Labour Party. And in general terms, most left-wing people, if there was no socialist standing in an election, would vote Green. Um, when they, but, but, but because they're like, but because they don't have actually no radical alternative to the system, or to the state machine when they actually took control of Yarra Council four years ago, which is the first time in the history of Australia that the Greens had taken control of a geographical area. We're not in a coalition, in a junior coalition position or in an opposition position, but actual total control. They had a majority of councillors on the council. Then you really saw their true colours because it's one thing to talk the talk, um, uh, you know, um, but, but actually to be in levers of power with three town halls and billions of dollars in assets and hundreds of million dollars budget, 950 to 1,000 staff, and actually have to carry you through your program where you'd actually, they didn't understand how power works. So the bureaucracy just ate them for their breakfast, the bureaucracy within the council. Um, they, they, um, they're obviously running a council that's capped, its rates are capped, it's financially, um, uh, it's, not, it's not loaded financially. And rather than kick up, to deal with that, or to, to, they, they kicked down and they introduced taxes that impacted on working class people. They made cuts to services and they, they created the monster that me and the people with me um, uh, reflect. So that's what happened with the Greens. Um, now they haven't taken the defeat very, very well. So they're just like blabbering out. And it's just like Hillary Clinton in 2016. It's a lot easier to, to blame the deplorables than look yourself in the mirror and go, you know, under under the Clintons, under Obama, we like fucked off every job and decent union paying job in America to Mexico or 
China, wherever the hell, and, 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 and cut services left, right, and center. Um, and working class people drifted from the Democrats. And, and to even, even a demagogue like Trump was able to capitalize on that, you know, very skillfully capitalize on that. But rather than, it's a lot easier to not look in the mirror. Right. It's a lot easier. Like a, the old saying in Ireland, a, black, a, a bad workman blames their tools, you know? Mm. Um, and that's an international phenomenon well, as well amongst the soft left. You know, Kamala is doing it to this day, you know? Um, yep. they, they do not want to look in the mirror because if they look in the mirror, what they see is 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 a party that is long the days it's long gone from looking after ordinary people so it's sort of like an interesting dynamic you know from my perspective as, as, a, as a marxist you know ever since the defeat of sanders and and corbyn the mm -hmm. left has been in sort of disarray internationally some of it gone off to extreme identity politics not that i'm against identity politics but taken as the only thing you do mm -hmm. And, and, and disassociating it from class politics is a mistake. I think some of the left have done that. Some of the left have just fallen into third, third you know, looking at maybe China and Russia as potentially the only way forward to us back in them unconditionally or semi-conditionally. Um, but keeping your bearings has been actually quite hard. So it's it's sort of an unusual phenomenon. So you've got the situation where it's like, like what we're doing, if you look at what we're doing, it's so much influenced by Liverpool in the early 1980s, Liverpool, mm. UK, when the militant tendency through the British Labour Party took control of the fifth biggest city in the UK and implemented um, an amazing program of housing, of sports centres, of apprenticeships and all the rest of it. It's an amazing book called Liverpool, a city that dared to fight. Right. That, you know, notwithstanding the fact that some of the one of the authors has maybe gone a bit off tap in recent years, nevertheless, it's a very, very good book. And But the difference between now and then is that like I don't lead with my chin and say i'm a leftist i'm a marxist mm. i'm a communist i'm a socialist when i'm asked i don't deny that because i am right. but but amongst working class people there's total confusion i was mm. talking to a working class person in melbourne yesterday who said it's really weird that the democrats told ukraine just before as biden's walking out the door you can use our long-range missiles you can bomb into russia and it's trump the Republican who's potentially going to make some type of peace deal. And this person was not trying to defend Trump. He was mm -hmm. he was talking about, or she was talking about, the, the, the fact that the left-right thing can be quite confusing if you just look at it in the, the way we looked at it 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why within the coalition that I've created in, in, the, in the area, there's people that have maybe traditionally have maybe voted for right-wing parties. Um, so it's sort of like a left populism, but I don't, I don't mean that in a Tammany Hall way. Mm. or louisiana way what's his name from back in the day you know the right the famous um but but it's like like a, i've had to adjust slightly because of the disarray of the left um that if i just simply just said i'm like i'm just like a communist socialist militant tendency i probably wouldn't have got dragged such a coalition of people from the different sort of sectors of society in yara to, to, to the degree where we've actually taken power and and some on the left don't like that Mm. Because many on the left like to eat their own and actually are quite happy, in my humble opinion, just smoking joints and drinking beer and just talking shit about capitalism. But mm. and I've got nothing against any of those things, by the way. I've done <laughs> done them many, many times. Often too many, too too often. too many times. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But 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 the, the the art of politics is moving from that scenario to into actually taking power. And if you read that book on Liverpool, which I encourage all your podcast listeners to listen to, it's like it's been like a bible for me. Because it's very, very rare in the post-war period where leftists have actually taken power. So how did they do it? That's the first question. And what did they do when they when they had power? Um, obviously, we've been influenced by that. Whether we can follow through is, is an open question. I think we can, but like, let's see. Yeah, I, you were talking about Huey Long, I think. Is that who we were, you yeah, were that's mentioning? Right, that's you right, were talking right. about. But um, so. Uh, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit more. You mentioned you kind of went over the agenda. That you guys the motions that you guys uh put forward in that omnibus bill um you know do you do you want to just uh dig into those a little bit more and you know especially like the housing piece of course that's like the kind of the biggest piece you know the the the, the um stadium i think too but the housing piece is like the big piece do you want to just talk about that a little bit and what are going to be the main you know well, what are i guess what do you see as the yeah, okay what like, are the obstacles you know to actually putting that stuff into place what do you see as the big yeah yeah. Well, I mean, there's a massive housing crisis in Australia. Like land is is uh, is a gold mine, and you know it's obviously mm. the same in the states and in Europe, yeah. in all the advanced capitalist countries. Never mind anywhere else. Right. You know the, the the option, like back in the 50s in the states in Australia, 
you could have a job and you could have some possibility of buying a property right um, and definitely of, of renting a property in a suburb that you wanted to, to, to live in and there was right. even rate capping in many parts of the USA that's like all down on the arse now and now mm. for young people um, it's a life of insecure jobs non-unionized low pay and a total you know um, cutting out of the property market in terms of buying a property and rental the rentals have just gone out of control so that's the same that's an international phenomenon and obviously in New York it's worse than it is in in, in, in other parts of America, in Melbourne, it's worse than it is in other parts of Australia, and so on and so forth. But that's a general sort of situation. And the solution to that on a, at a mass, on a high level, is for in Australia and in the States, if you had a, you know, a Sanders presidency and, a, and, and like 20% of the Democrats being sort of, you know, uh, DSA types, I'm just making this up here, you know, right. Jacobin were like getting hard on five years ago, thinking that was like a possibility. But just say that had happened, which wasn't without the realms of possibility. It was the, not the most likely option, but it was possible. Um, you know, you would have to like change the whole tax system, you know, which, which, which at the moment in Australia and America, you know, benefits developers. You know, you would have to rebuild public housing and see building a public housing by the government as a good public housing, not shit public housing. Right. You know, they're all things that in Australia that the federal and the state government we lobby for every day. However, what we said, which was unique, was that while all of that stuff is true, that the long-term solution to the housing crisis is 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 is, is intervening in the market and dealing with with the capitalist mismanagement of the housing crisis, which goes to their uselessness as a system and late capitalism. That doesn't mean that at a local level we can't do some shit already. Right. So what we're doing at a local level, in the big picture, it's relatively minor, but it actually is meaningful. And there's two things that we're doing. One, and I'll start with the least important, and I'll start with the most important. Then I'll go to the most important. Yep. The second thing is what, what they call inclusion rezoning. So when all these developers come in, by the way, the area that I represent that I lead is an ex-working class area that's now being gentrified. So it's mm. sort of like Islington in London, where Jeremy Corbyn is the MP. Mm. Yeah, there'll be parts of the states where you've got inner city areas that used to be working class that are now being fully gentrified and they're really, really expensive to live in. So you've got that sort of area, but it's very progressive. It's the most left-wing voting area in Australia, notwithstanding the fact that it's professional managerial class. Mm -hmm. It's that type of professional managerial class. But also in that area, there's three, what you call in America projects, three massive public housing estates where almost all the people of color or all the poor people live. And that's obviously my electoral base. Um, so, so you've got this extreme disparity in the one area. Mm. So, so the second thing that we, the sec, the second most important thing we're going to do is force every developer who comes into town, who buys an old empty factory, gets it rezoned, and then wants to put twenty stories of fancy apartments up. We say to them right at the start: if you want to get past first base, you have to have 10, 20 percent housing, social housing, housing for working class people, and if you don't. They can appeal that, and if inevitably, because of the capitalist system, ju judicial system, they will win in the end. But we can fuck them up for three years. Right. And most of the developers are, are borrowing money from the bank. They've got a they've got a construction company that they've employed to build the bloody thing. The speed is so important. That's right. why construction in Australia is so powerful. So we can fuck them up by slowing them down, and they know that. They mm -hmm. know that they'll win eventually. But you know, three years is like a lifetime to a developer who's trying to build in a competitive marketplace so we believe that we can force by being much more aggressive with the developers a percentage of low-cost housing the second thing that we can do is the council own a heap of land heaps of land that we're not using at the moment so we want to use that land to develop um, housing specifically aimed at young people who can show a relationship to the area like they went to school in the area they were brought up in the area the parents live in the area they work in the area they party in the area because this by the way, my area is the center of the nightlife, the LGBT I mm. scene, you know, all the restaurants. It's like the most best place at night to go out, you know. It's <laughs> nice. Like it's got the nightlife sort of center of, of, of Yarra. Um, but no young person anymore. Like my two kids are a classic example, born and bred in the area, but they can't afford to live in this mm. area. Um, so um, what we want to do is build housing with, with a percentage being put aside at capped rents for, the, for those kids. So let's say 50% of market rate. And I don't know about you in Minneapolis, but if you could have a brand new apartment, if you're a 29 year old and you're a barista in Starbucks or whatever, 
um, on whatever the fucking minimum wage is, <laughs> right. you get a brand new apartment on 50% of the market rate. That's life changing. Mm -hmm. That means that you can live, you could even save potentially. Right. To do whatever you want to do, you know, travel, maybe buy somewhere in the medium term, maybe not in the area that you live in. They might have to go to the sticks a bit, but like it is literally a life changing thing. So we're doing that. And that's what's excited people that it's not just incremental stuff. And that's why everyone in, in, in Liverpool, sorry, in the UK in the 80s were so excited about the Liverpool thing. It wasn't just about fucking Liverpool. It's just a council in the fifth biggest city in a, in a, in a, in a ex imperial giant. Right. What they did was so important. They showed that when Marx has taken control of a local council, you know, we can employ working class kids on apprenticeships. We can build three massive support centers. They built more housing in Liverpool than the entire council, so labor controlled councils of the rest of the UK added up together. And it was like a beacon of hope. Now, I'm not trying to compare ourselves to Liverpool. It's a much smaller example, but, but we're influenced. Well, I'm influenced mm -hmm. by that experience to leave a legacy to say, if we can do it in Yarra, um fuck's sake we can do it anywhere sort of thing do you know what i mean and that's my goal and that's my sort of dream for the next four year term um and we're going to have a red hot crack what i'm not going to do is sell out i don't right. want my kids saying to me you know steve he was a fucking marxist he was in Tiananmen square and you know was involved in the underground in south africa and all this sort of stuff and he was a good counselor as soon as he became mayor he just caved into the pressure so right. even if we go hard and at the end of the day we lose because the state government forced by the developers and the media come and close us down, which they have got the right to do. That's the worst case scenario. At least we have left a legacy like Liverpool did because they got closed down too. Um, but what we're not going to do is sell out. And that's something that, you know, unfortunately Sanders and Corbyn can't say, do you know, right. we're just fed up of glorious defeats. Well, actually, I don't mind a glorious defeat. <laughs> what, I, what, what is an inglorious defeat? An inglorious <laughs> defeat. We're not going to do that in Yarra. So watch this space, you know? Yeah, I really encourage everyone to keep their eyes on what's going on there and, uh, you know, show support in any way they can if they're, you know, uh, I mean, because this is something that, you know, we want to do with a lot of this stuff all over the world, right? We need housing. People need housing in just about every country in the world right now. Uh, it's a serious issue, not to mention the affordability crisis overall, not just in housing, but across so many different uh uh, areas it's just on that one thing I forgot to mention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what you call projects, what we call public housing estate, like 20, 22 story blocks of public housing sure. towers that were built in Australia in the late 60s, early 70s. I guess it's pretty much the same in the States. The state government, so there's three levels of government in Australia there's federal, state, and council, obviously mm. on the local level. The state uh, controls the public housing, controls the projects, and they announced recently they want to chop, knock them all down. All 48 high-rise towers in, in our area, 12 in Yarra, 48 in Melbourne, and um, basically sell it off to developers. So one of the things that, that I've done is I've, I've moved, which was accepted last Tuesday, to set up a housing committee, mm. which will bring in leaders from all of the projects with councillors, with other progressive people, council officers, uh, and we will build up a campaign backed by the council machine to defend those towers because at the moment those public housing tenants are on their own mm. and so maybe a few left-wing parties and the greens help them at a rally this and that but having this a, a, a wing of the state machine coming in behind a community campaign we did that before 10 years ago when we stopped like this really really bad freeway that they want to build through all these working class houses mm. in my area um, so having a wing of the state with all with like 950 staff hundreds of millions of dollars budget at three town halls coming in behind a campaign to save the projects, to save the towers, takes that campaign to a totally different level. Right. So there's there's various things that we're doing that aren't like obvious. And if anyone wants to keep an eye on it, like I'm going to be bringing out on my Instagram every week, like an update, like a minute and a half or less Instagram update. And that's the easiest way for people in the States just to keep an eye on what we're doing in um, sleepy old Melbourne. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you speaking with me. And I, yeah, I encourage everybody to keep their eyes uh, on your uh, Instagram. Is there anything else you want to share or anything else you want to plug before you, uh, before we wrap up? Well, you know what I mean? Like anytime you do something like this, I remember when I was in Tiananmen Square in 1989, I think what the, I was 27 years old. And, and out of the blue, I ended up speaking to half a million people at Tiananmen Square four days before the massacre. And I just thought I'm totally unprepared, underprepared, I should say, for mm -hmm. this 
And I feel like, even though I've been doing this a long time, I've been, you know, active socialist since I was 18. Um, we're, we're learning on the job. So if there's anyone in the States, and I mean this in all honesty, because I'm just answering your question directly, right. that thinks that we're fucking up or has got an idea for us or says, why don't you look at it this way? Or I think you made a mistake that way. We are really, really keen to get feedback and we will take it really, really well. Um, so I'd encourage people to not only look at what we're doing, but throw the you know, e email, message, whatever way, give us your opinion on what we're doing and how we could do it better. Well, like I said, I'm really impressed with what you're doing and I'm excited to see, you know, what comes and the uh, struggles that develop. Um, and again, like I said, I really, really appreciate your time, Stephen. Thanks, Nick. Pleasure. Anytime. And that's our special interview. Thanks for listening. Solidarity. This has been a Socialist News and Views special interview.